record. Okay. Welcome to Art 244. We're going to do a little bit of an unboxing here, and I've got to figure out what the best um, view of this thing is going to be. I don't like this one at all, so I'm going to change video angles and see what this looks like because this is a better one. So this is my bird's eye view. This is looking down on my desktop. So you guys are gonna get a cardboard box. And in the cardboard box will be a lamp. And I went ahead and I ordered these kind of lamps because they have a much smaller, narrower bell on the lamp. And I had to, I had to go through my house and change out all of my light bulbs from incandescence to LED bulbs so that I could take these incandescent bulbs, these 60 watt incandescent bulbs, which are not available anymore, and load them into these um, light fixtures so that you've got this. What this is gonna be, oh crap, I gotta change, change video again. So let's change camera. Okay, go back to this one. Okay. So this is a clamp-on light, like any kind of clamp-on light for working or trouble light or something like this for working on your car. And I'm gonna ask you guys to take this light and clamp it onto the box like this so that the light shines down into your box. And so you're gonna use this as a warming thing. You know, instead of having little chickens or little eggs or something in here to warm, we're gonna warm the wax that's gonna be down inside your box so that you have warmed wax to work with. So I'm gonna set this aside for just a second and show you what I've got over here, which is my box that I work with. And look at all that nasty um, brown wax that's on the sides and everything, because this has been used for several years now. And so I've got wax warming down in here. It is getting all of the light and all of the heat coming off of, you know, kind of like a 60 watt bulb. And that gives me, pre-warmed wax that's softened, that doesn't take hardly any um, effort for me to then just soften the rest of the weight in my fingers so that it's malleable like clay so that we can sculpt with this in the additive process. And I'm gonna be doing demonstrations with this box of warm wax later this evening. So that's what we're doing. So in addition to the box and the light that goes on the box, you get, um, a couple of fistfuls of wax. You're going to get a whole bunch of wax that's broken up into little tiny pieces. And um, uh, it's, it's going to be good for sculpting, especially when you put the light on it. Paula asks, uh, what's the difference between this wax and paraffin wax? Ugh, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to depart a little bit from my presentation to answer your question. Um, and then I'll come back to the presentation. Um, this wax as seen against my lovely gray shirt here. This wax is a brown microcrystalline wax. It is a petroleum-based wax. When it, when it uh, cools down after being poured out um, as a liquid, when, it's, when it solidifies, it creates little teeny tiny microcrystals that create a little bit more structure to the wax so that it has a little bit more structural integrity, structural um, stability, than uh, working with paraffin wax, although it also is soft enough so that it and pliable enough so that we can sculpt with it. Paraffin wax is really weird. It's another, um, it's a harder wax. And so it's, it's either um, liquid or solid. It doesn't really like to work in this semi solid state where it can be modeled and that kind of thing. So paraffin wax is not a good sculpting wax this Victory Brown. It's got the word, the name Victory Brown because it was developed around the Second World War and everything was a victory thing. Victory Gardens, Victory whatever, and Victory Brown Wax. So this is now an 80-year-old product, um, first designed for the casting industry around the Second World War. This has been part of the, the lost wax casting industry for the last 80 years or so, and it's a really good wax. If you were gonna to try to formulate a wax, paraffin plus beeswax would probably be a good kind of substitute for this. You'd need at least you know, like two parts paraffin to one part beeswax, mix them together, pour them out into thin sheets, and then you get something like this. The nice thing about paraffin and beeswax is that you get a light yellow wax instead of this dark brown wax. This is a little bit harder to see the forms and surfaces of the wax. But anyway, I'm going to 
I'm going to demonstrate that just a little bit later on. So getting back to the toolbox, you guys are gonna get one of these. You're gonna get the box, you're gonna get the light, you're getting an incandescent light bulb, which is no longer available in the United States. Um, and you're gonna get a bunch of wax to work with. So you're gonna get that. Plus you're gonna get this little baggie full of tools. And so what's gonna be in the bag? Um, you're gonna get a, a needle tool so that you can draw lines on the wax and do tiny little sculpting operations like putting nostrils onto a kitty cat or a bunny rabbit or something like that. You're gonna get a needle tool. You might, if I can find them, you might get a, uh, some version of a dental tool because dental tools are shaped ends and they can be really handy for sculpting little teeny tiny sculpting stuff. Um, somebody moved my dental tools and I'm having a, little, a lot of trouble finding them right now, but I had this great big bag donated last year. So I will find the dental tools. You're gonna get a butter knife. Yes, you are, you lucky people are gonna get a butter knife because this is the tool that I would like you to use as a hot tool. I'm not going to give you a propane torch because I just can't buy 15 propane torches and bottles and send them out the door. Plus there's a little bit of liability involved. So you guys are gonna to have to come up with your own heat source, either a candle or a propane torch or a little alcohol torch or something, but you're gonna to have to at least a candle to be able to use a hot tool for this process. The okay. hot tool is not required for what you're gonna do. It's definitely required for what I'm gonna do. And I will be able to use a hot tool to finish up your sculptures when they come in the door here. If they happen to be things that are falling apart and breaking, I can weld them up with my hot tool. So, so far we've talked about these three tools, which are relatively, um, nondescript tools. The most important tool that you're going to receive, and this one is well worn, this is a hand forged Italian made sculpting tool, a double ended sculpting tool. And both ends have a curved blade on both ends. And one side of the blade is serrated, and one side of the blade is a straight, sharp edge, and it's reversed on the other end. So you can carve around left-handed corners with this one. You can flip it around and carve around right-handed corners with this one. This is a really cool tool. They don't even make these anymore. I think I bought the last 10 of them that were in existence last summer. And so I've got about 20 of these on hand. And so um, this is an old one that I have taken some um, uh, tape, uh, duct tape. And I've wrapped duct tape around the middle handle portion so it's bigger and a little bit more ergonomic because when you're sculpting with this for hours and hours, your fingers get sore and it's no fun to sculpt with this thing without a nice big tape handle on it. Some of you are not getting that though. Some of you are getting a brand new tool and I don't have the time to carefully make handles for all of the tools. So a brand new from the factory sculpting tool looks like this. This is just a little bit different than the one I just had in my hand, but you can see that this was made out of um, hex, no, octagonal tool steel because it's still an octagonal tool steel in the middle. And then the two ends were forged out and they were forged into shapes and then they were ground and um, you know finished off into these wonderful shaped ends for sculpting with. So when you get this thing, if you find that your hand gets cramped up or that it's too difficult to hold on to, if you take some duct tape or any kind of tape and wrap the handle with tape to make a fatty handle on it, it'll be much easier to work with. We'll talk about that more once you get the tools. But this stuff is put together in a, um, hermetically sealed a Ziploc bag. Um, it will be um, put together for several days before you get it. So any germs that I put on there will be dead by then. Dead germs, um, clean tools, all for you. So I have to make up, because I've got 15 or 16 people signed up in this class, I have to make up 16 of these things. Oh, there's one more thing. I'm gonna be putting in each one 
at least one or two sheets of wax. I talked to you guys the other night about the idea of a sheet of wax that might be a, a quarter of an inch thick. Well, this is what they look like. This is a sheet of wax that I have melted into a liquid and then poured out into an open face mold so that then when it's allowed to cool, I have these large sheets of wax. And I'll show you why I made this uh, towards the end of tonight's demonstration. So, you know, I spent 10 bucks on the lamps. I spent 20 bucks on sculpting on the hand forged sculpting tool that's not even available anymore. That's $30 worth of stuff. There's another 10 bucks worth of stuff in there. So there's $40 worth of stuff in this kit that I'm giving out to you guys. I'm not giving it to you. I want these kits back at the end of the quarter. If, if I don't get the kit of tools back for you, minus the wax that you use, um, I'm not going to give you a grade in this class because I want all these tools back. This took, I love these tools. I have a close personal relationship to these tools and it took me a long time to give you, some, you know, a really good kit like this. So at the end of the quarter, when you bring in your sculpture pieces for me to cast in bronze, I want you to bring the tools back too. So I thought I'd tell you that from the beginning so that you understood what we're gonna do here. Okay, I'm gonna do some demonstrations now. Um, so you guys are dead in the water. You can't do anything. I don't have any wax for you yet tonight. So you're gonna have to watch this and you know, mope, um, take notes or draw pictures and conjure up new sculpture designs based on what I'm gonna be talking about and stuff like that. So let's go. Um, I have done a little research and I want to do two things. I want to show you a tiny beginning sculpture that everybody can try so that, you know, you can get your feet wet with this and it's an icebreaker and some people crank, crank this out in one sitting and that's fantastic. So I'm going to do my share screen. Come on. And I got to go find the thing. Where is it? Oh, it's this one. Let's try this one. Okay. So I'm sharing this screen and I got, oh, where's my stuff? I can't find this, ah, go away. Okay, so I did a, I did a Google image search for rabbits, for bunny rabbits. And so this is what I came up with, with bunny rabbit Google search. My, my search terms were small, bronze, rabbit, sculpture. And so, and I hit images for Google image search and I came up with all of these images. Very nice, I can scroll down here. I can try to find a bunny that I'm interested in sculpting. Oh, look, this little guy over here looks really cute. I might wanna sculpt that one, but I don't wanna sculpt a bunny. I did another Google image search for cats because everybody loves cats, right? And I scroll down here and I scrolled through all this stuff to try to find some kind of artistic looking cat that I could sculpt, especially as a quick um, demonstration piece tonight. And what I came up with was this. Yes, indeed. I came up with this thing. So I'm going to try sculpting this thing and I'm going to talk, talk us through it while I do. So I'm going to push this back up to the top of the thing. Can you guys see me? Can you see this sculpture thing? Okay. Yay. I'm going to be departing from this from time to time and trying to do a demonstration too. So I'm going to hit the stop share screen and I'm going to do something like this. I'm going to reach over into my box of wax and I'm going to try to get some of this pre-warmed wax stuff that's underneath the lamp that's off camera that you can't see. So these are softened pieces of wax. And as I break them apart and kind of pull them like taffy in my hands, you can kind of see that they're softening up and at body temperature, they work a whole lot like, um, modeling clay, like an oil, like a oil-based or even a water-based clay that you might have in any other kind of a ceramics or sculpture class. And so I'm just going to use this stuff to make my cat. So this cat that I was looking at, let's, let's go back to the cat because we can, because it's right there. Okay, so this is some kind of an art deco, long-necked kind of a cat. This looks like it came from about the 1920s. It's abstracted slightly, but you can still tell that it's a cat because it has little pointy ears and obnoxious cat eyes. 
and it has the long, 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 long elongated cat neck, which makes me think that it's kind of art deco. And so I'm trying to rough out a tiny little cat body based on that in my hands. And so I'm gonna look at that and look at that and look at that. We've got the front legs are going straight. The back legs are bent behind it. The tail curls around and some kind of little seductive cat um, pose or cat, you know, thing that cats do. I hate cats anyway. So I am doing a cat sculpture for you guys and I hate cats. And I just thought I'd let you know. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing this again and I'm gonna come back to a different camera. Let's try this camera because, okay, so I'm working with this cat sculpture. And the additive process, if you've never done sculpture before, is to tear off little bits of wax and then push them on and blend them in with your thumbs. So this is the source material for the wax. This is the sculpture. Sometimes it's hard to tell which is which, right? Okay, so my sculpture, I'm envisioning this sculpture as only being three inches tall. So this is a small sculpture, small scale sculpture. It's what I would consider to be an intimate scale sculpture. It's gonna sit intimately in the palm of my hand. Intimate scale sculptures are totally fine as a sculpture medium. Um, I had a woman in my class 20 years ago. Um, she was a new age person and she wanted to, she was really interested in ancient um, uh, fertility goddesses. And so she wanted to do a bunch of ancient fertility goddess kinds of sculpture. And hey, Kylie Lively is here, yay, okay. And so she made these fertility goddesses that would fit in the palm of your hand, about the size of a worry stone that you could hold in your hand and kind of rub with your thumb. Have you guys ever tried or seen any of those worry stones that are available places? I mean, it's just a really simple concept. But she made these little um, goddesses kind of based, you know, on the fertility goddesses from the Paleolithic period, the Stone Age period, um, uh, that are found in lots of caves and cave art and stuff like that. And so, you know, she's uh, was really into that. They've kind of featured the belly and torso of a female figure, um, kind of featuring the um, uh, reproductive system. And let's see, this would go something like this. I don't know. I'm trying to talk and sculpt at the same time, and that's really hard. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get four little vestigial feet or um, yeah, feet and legs kind of started on the bottom end of my cat here. Um, so, you know, these things were basically torsos with tiny little vestigial uh, legs sticking out of one end and teeny tiny little arms, just little nubbins of arms sticking out the sides and a teeny tiny little featureless head sticking out the other end. And it was just this beautiful little um, uh, fertility goddess that you could hold in the palm of your hand. And both the form of the sculpture and the intimate scale of the sculpture, the teeny tiny scale of the sculpture was really beautiful. Um, does anybody have a, did somebody want to make a comment? Uh, I heard somebody gasp for air while I was talking. Kylie, was that you? No, I didn't do nothing. You didn't do nothing. Okay. Did you just arrive? Did you find yeah. your way into my classroom? That's For good. some welcome. reason, the email didn't come through on my end, and it. Oh. Well, okay, uh, it's okay. We're just we're doing this thing. I've got the record button on, so this thing will be recorded and then posted as a YouTube video. So as I'm sculpting, um, it will be it will be posted on YouTube. You can look at it and you can fast forward through the boring parts. There's never any boring parts, are uh, there? I also just showed up also too. Sorry about that. My kids kind of had a meltdown. <laughs> <You're all, laughs> your kids had a meltdown. The nation's capital had a meltdown today. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. So in the, in the meantime, I'm roughing out this sculpture and trying to get a cat-like head on top of this thing. I better probably line up the head with the legs. So right now I just did that scene from The Exorcist where her head goes around and around and around on her neck because I had to put the, I had to line up the head with the front legs of my little 
what do you call this? Cat, cat form. So this is really um, rudimentary and it's very abstract when you first start out making them. And so the idea is first you blast it out as a roughed out form and then you refine, 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 refine the forms. And so that's what we're gonna try to do. How many legs have I got on here? I do have four legs on here. How it wound up with four legs, I'll never know. But that's, that's interesting. Okay, so it's got four legs. So once again, this feels like <clears throat> an art deco cat. Let's go, <clears throat> excuse me. You know what I should really do? I should do the split screen thing so I can put up the thing on my share screen and my live screen at the same time. Do you think if I do this, everything will blow up? Do it. Probably, I don't know if I can do it or not. Okay, where, where would I do that? Where would I, I don't know. Anyway, so this is the, this is the thing I'm trying to do. And this is the monstrosity that I have so far. It's not so bad for 15 minutes worth of work. So we would sit and we would continue quietly refining the sculpture, picking off little tiny bits of softened clay, softened wax and applying them just like clay in an additive process and refining and refining the forms. And once you get something built up like this, then you can start refining it with your fancy sculpting tool because I can then take this thing with a serrated edge especially and supporting, supporting the sculpture really carefully so I don't break it in half, I can then try to scrape along surfaces to unify surfaces and straighten out the lumps and the bumps and take the bumps off of the high spots and fill in the low spots. And so refining the form tries to you know, straighten everything out and get it more perfect for those of you who are perfectionists. I hope there's no perfectionists in here because you know perfection is like the enemy of the good. And sometimes it's really the enemy of good sculpture because oftentimes imperfect sculptures are more interesting than perfect sculptures. And so, but you get the idea. This is what we, what I would like you guys to do first. And as soon as I can get wax into your hands, you know, this is a really nice entry level kind of a piece to do. And you could probably blast one of these out in about three hours of sitting, about the equivalent of one of our class periods. And if you did this, let's see, this much wax would turn into about a dollar's worth of bronze. And so for a buck, you could cast this as a side piece that you could give to a child or a significant other or somebody who's got a birthday or Valentine's Day coming up. I'm not going to make Valentine's Day. This We won't get these cast until March. So forget about Valentine's Day. But anyway, you could make, you know, a critter of some kind, a small kitty cat, um, a frog, uh, the rabbit concept. So many people have made sea turtles that it's not even funny, but you could make a small sea turtle and you could blast out a sea turtle in an hour in the, with this concept. And then really the only thing that makes this go longer and longer is your uh, inability to accept the beauty of the abstraction and your determination to try to make this look as realistic as possible because that's the thing that's gonna take you hours and hours and hours of refining the form to do is to try to turn this into some kind of realistic looking cat with a long neck on it. Because realistic long neck cats just don't happen. It has to be an abstraction of a cat of some kind. I think I did that for half an hour. I think I'm gonna quit because you get the idea and I'm gonna move on to the next thing. And the next thing, I'm gonna put my cat over here where it's not gonna get hurt. I'm gonna do the next thing, which is a bigger sculpture. So um, to recap, um, I am putting together these uh, sculpture kits, these um, tool kits, which will hopefully be ready by Friday, but otherwise I'm gonna to try to get them ready for pick up on Monday so that if you guys can pick these things up during the day on Monday, you'll still have the ability to work with it in, in class Monday night. This class only meets on Monday and Wednesday nights, so you don't actually meet on Friday, but maybe I can get this thing put together by Friday. 
Um, what you're going to need for your workstation in front of your computer is another extension cord so that you can run the lamp to give yourself the warming that has to happen inside the box to make warm wax inside the box. You're going to need an extension cord and then maybe somewhere down the line you're going to need the next thing I'm going to demonstrate. So I'm bringing in now the torch and I'm going to try to do a little bit larger sculpting and I'm going to do it with um, fire as one of the tools that I'm going to work with. So I'm going to take everything that's flammable away from my workstation and replace it with, with a fire. board. What's that? I don't trust you with fire. <laughs> oh, you don't trust me with fire. I don't trust you guys with fire. I've got another camera here. So I'm going to see what this camera angle is going to do for me um, for this particular project. So let's try. I like to also sh show off, you know, all the bells and whistles in this thing. So this is my side camera over here. It's off to the side. So I've got my fire scarecrow right here. And I'm going to be sculpting right in this spot. And you guys are on the computer right there. And I'm right here. So you're seeing me from the side here. So I'm gonna bring in this lovely little sculpture right here. What is she doing? Well, I'm a figure sculptor and I was making this little figure over the years. And one year I had a student who was trying to make some kind of hummingbird thing. And this was a hummingbird that she made and then was throwing back into the wax box. And I said, I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna to try to do something with it. So I took art history and taught a lot of art history. And I remember Hieronymus Bosch, from the early part of Northern European Renaissance. And he painted all these really crazy weird things with nudes kind of cavorting around uh, with uh, oversized birds and fruit and stuff like that, especially in his very famous painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights. And so I thought I would do an homage to um, Hieronymus Bosch. And so this is one of those nude figures um, playing um, uh, Hyo Silver and uh, the, you know, the Lone Ranger on the back of this kind of crazy little bird that my student made. So um, I wanted to show you the sculpting technique that we would use with larger things. And housing doesn't let us have open flames in our apartment. Okay, well, well then we're just going to have to work with the warm wax and the warm wax box and um, don't have an open flame in housing. Sorry about that. So um, I can do welding of stuff. For instance, if I'm sculpting along on this thing and suddenly, oh, the arm broke off. What am I going to do? How am I going to stick that arm back on there? That's where welding the wax comes in handy. And so that's where I have um, some kind of a flame heat source to be able to heat up a butter knife. And that you can see the discoloration on the end of my butter knife that I stole from the cafeteria for this purpose. Um, so the only tool that I would want you to actually get hot is the butter knife because it's stainless steel and I don't care about the butter knife. The hand forged Italian sculpting tool, I do not want this thing to be touched by fire because it will take all of the temper out of the tool steel ends and then they will get soft and they will bend around a whole lot or they will get brittle and they will break off. So I don't want this to be in open flame or to get heated up uh, repeatedly and stuff. Do not heat the Italian sculpting tool. That's what the butter knife is for. So uh, if we were doing this, this class in the art studio here, then we would have eight of these things at the four corners of the two big butcher block tables that we do bronze casting at. So you turn on the valve and you get the fire going and now you can see the fire in the background and it's burning blue and i'm going to try to turn this around so that i can see the broken joint here where my person uh got broken off so what i'm going to do is hold the um hold the knife blade in the flame and because it's a this kind of a flame I, you know for five seconds should do it and then line up the two mating surfaces and then put the knife right between the two and pull it out and hold it until it freezes back down. You're actually welding. You're bringing the two surfaces to a fusion temperature where it becomes liquid wax. 
you pull the knife out, you stick them together, and then you don't move it anymore. When the wax um, cools back down again, it forms its microcrystalline structure and it forms a really strong joint there so that now this is not a weak joint anymore. It's put back together as a nice strong joint. I can also, let's see, can I bring you in closer? I don't know how much closer I can bring you in. And will it actually focus? That's a good question too. I can heat up the knife and I can also plunge the knife into a joint like this to re-weld a joint. And so I can plunge it in deeply and bring that wax to um, uh, fusion temperature. I can melt the wax into a liquid. Now it is, um, it is solidifying again. The surrounding wax is pulling the heat out of that weld zone and it is solidifying. And again, making a nice, strong, completed weld for me in that spot. Um, since you guys can't do a whole lot of um, heat work on campus, I'm going to put this away and try to confine what I'm doing to um, working cold with my tools. So I'm a figurative sculpture. I make the human figure. Um, the human figure is a really important part of art and, and the nude human figure really has nothing to do with sexuality so much as it has to do with sensuality and especially in art the nude is has a huge long history of um, talking about um, the highest aspirations of human endeavors it's a transcendent and spiritual kind of a thing that we work with and so um, it's very legit to do the figure to do the nude human figure in art if you ever take an art history class, history of Western art, um, ancient Greece and ancient Rome were all about human figure sculpture in a naturalistic representational kind of a way. The Greeks started it and Greek civilization went for about, you know, 500 years or so before the Romans took them over. And then we're so impressed with what the Greeks were doing that they brought them all back to Rome and made them slaves so that they could uh, make sculptures for the Romans, uh, which is what Romans do. Um, they're kind of nasty folks actually in terms of uh, assimilating other cultures and uh, exploiting them for their own purposes. But anyway, while I'm doing this, I am sculpting with the tool. I'm trying to see if I can make this I'm gonna try a different camera because this one doesn't seem to wanna to focus there. So let's, let's go to here and we'll go to here and I'll do it in front of myself like this. And I don't know if this is gonna be any better. I'm gonna to try to get an angle and up everything so that you can see what's going on here. And I'm gonna work up here. So I'm, I'm using the serrated edge of this tool to smooth out, to blend, and to refine surfaces. So I'm gonna work on the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. The deltoid muscle is that wonderful baseball sized muscle that covers the shoulder and gives all this wonderful definition to this portion of the shoulder here and um, transitions into the triceps in the back and the biceps on the front. And so I can, I can rough it out with the additive process and my fingertips and everything. And the resulting additive process leaves a really rugged um, abstract kind of a surface that's all about additive process. And you can see some of that additive process in the texture that might still be on top of the scalp and the where the hair ought to be or will the hair where the hair will become. This is additive process texture right here. And I haven't done any scraping to the to the scalp yet because I'm, I haven't arrived at a hairstyle for this sculpture. But I'm working out the, um, you know, the uh, muscles, the muscle groups and the surfaces of, um, of the skin down here. And so that's what all of this um, scraping is all about is trying to just refine, refine, refine what's going on. Because, you know, it doesn't take much for this person to have a Popeye arm to have a great big, huge, oversized muscular forearm. 
and to find exactly the taper that it takes to get from the elbow through the slight muscular bulge in the forearm to um, taper it down again to the wrist. You know, it takes a little bit of time and attention to detail to get those kinds of um, uh, proportions worked out and those kinds of forms worked out. I'm working on the back of her hand right now. And I'm gonna work a little bit on the kind of the grooves between the bones on the back of her hand and that kind of thing. Um, I think I might go to the quadriceps on the top of the thigh and I'm gonna play with the quads just a little bit, trying to refine things just a little bit more. When a person is seated like this, the quads are um, in tension, they're pulled long, they're not in compression. And of course the um, hamstring is in compression a little bit. So we might see a little bit more bulge on the hamstring muscle on the back underside of the thigh, whereas the top of the thigh, it's gonna be curving, but it's gonna be a, a much more gradual curve. And so we work out all of those kinds of details over time and just working it and working it and working it. And this takes hours. A sculpture like this would take me 40 hours of just sculpting on it um, continuously. And I only sculpt on this piece. I've been working on this piece for 10 years because I do it as a demonstration during the first week of the quarter. And then I set it aside. So um, this is my 10 year piece uh, that I've been working on as I slowly, slowly, slowly refine it for um, as a demonstration for you guys. But you can see the details of the facial features and the details of the emerging details of the fingers in the upraised hand. And so slowly it emerges as a more refined, more and more refined, more realistic figure form, which is pretty good for something that is only what? This is a sculpture that we could cast in bronze here at this college. And this is probably 12 inches high from the tip of the upraised hand to the base element where the, um, the feet of the crow uh, bird are down on the bottom. I've got some temporary wax props glued in here, or I should say welded in here to kind of help support her because the tiny little feet on that bird are not strong enough by themselves in wax to support the weight of the bird plus the rider on the bird's back. And so there's a, there's a planar piece of a slab of wax that's been welded into this base element wax down here. And it's been welded up against the, um, the foot and the ankle area of, of the leg. And there's another one over on this side that's doing the same thing. And these two are temporary props that would be removed right before the bronze casting process when I was satisfied that the entire sculpture was sculpted and completed and everything, then I would cut those out and then finish up the surface refinements on the, on the places where they were welded in there. But they've, they've served me well over the years to help to support the weight of all of this on top of these tiny little bird legs down there. And so I'm going to take another breath and look at the clock. And I see that I've been talking now for 45 minutes. It's always interesting to see how long I can talk because that's kind of fun. So I'm going to restore this to the original, whatcha, the original angles. And so this is what I do. Um, I can, I'm just going to run through my uh, different camera angles really quickly here. Um, I'll be able to demonstrate sculpting with a bird, bird's eye camera view looking straight down on my tabletop and I'll be able to sculpt, sculpt, sculpt like this, hopefully on something large enough so that you can see it because this cat, you know, really has to kind of come up close to the camera before you can really see some of the details that are emerging in the cat. In fact, I was looking at the back of the cat's head. Now I'm looking at the front of the cat's head and ears right now. So if I'm sculpting from a bird's eye view, I'm gonna be able to share this view with you. Um, and so I'm just gonna run through them all really quick. And if I need to, from the side, talk about what I'm sculpting on and working on and trying to illustrate how I'm working, 
Um, this is my side view camera that I can do. And finally, of course, the talking head camera is my frontal view, which is awfully hard to put both the sculpture in and my head in because with the distances that I'm dealing with, I can only really focus on one thing and not both. So those are some little teeny tiny demonstrations of sculpting in wax and working with wax. And a little demonstration, again, I went out and did a Google image search to, to, to try to come up with an image that I was interested in maybe replicating from some existing sculptures, bronze cast sculptures, that have been done and that are out there online. And I highly recommend that you guys do that too. Um, I'd really like it if you could find a sculpture or an image, you know, a, a photograph of an animal like an elk or something out in nature or something like that, to be able to download it and print it out. And it'd be great if you could find different multiple angles and sides of the thing that you're interested in, whether it's a nude human figure, or whether it's an elk, or a kitty cat sculpture, or a bunny rabbit, or whatever it's going to be, if you could find two or three sides to it, the front side, the back side, and maybe a side view or a three-quarter view of the thing that you're looking at, and they don't have to be of exactly the same one, they can be different views of different things, but that would somehow be related so that you can start to understand the sculpture in the round because the sculpture in the round is going to present you with thousands of different views of it as you turn it around and look at it from all different sides so it would be nice if you had more than one view of a source material that you could look at while you're trying to replicate that source material three-dimensionally as a sculpture so please um, with the time you have the rest of this week and this weekend if you can look around for imagery of something that inspires you, that you want to sculpt, and then if you can find different versions of that thing, even if it's not the exact same thing, but, you know, different views of a wizard, you know, a wizard doing his wizard thing from three different views. If you're going to sculpt a wizard, you know, it'd be nice to have some various viewpoints of the wizard so that you've got not just one directionality and one flat image to look at. And then please print them out so that they're, you have hard copies of them. When I come back on Monday, I'm going to continue demonstrating the way that I sculpt. And I'm going to have one of my sculptures that I'm working on contemporaneously in front of me that I'm working on. I'm also going to show you the printouts of the, uh, the imagery that I keep right here on the workspace so that I can have something to refer to. I need reference material to look at. I can't make this stuff up from my mind's eye or from my uh, imagination. Very few people, almost no sculptors can just sculpt out of their imagination um, very effectively. Most of us do need to use um, visual reference source materials to look at while we're sculpting. Um, are we allowed to do something original or is it highly discouraged? Oh, do something original. If you want to base it off of one of your drawings, um, you can draw something and then base a sculpture off of a drawing. It's highly encouraged to do that. I've got a, a class here that has all different kinds of um, experience and skill level. So half the people in this class have never done any art before. And I'm going to start them from scratch. And half of you guys have taken a bunch of art classes in high school and you have red hair and, you know, you're highly gifted and talented. Yes, 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 you do. And so um, everybody's going to approach this with a different skill set and that's going to be just fine. Um, and I appreciate the questions. So thanks for writing the questions in the chat. And anytime you guys want to interrupt me, please interrupt me because I've now been talking for almost an hour and I, uh, it wears me out and I get sore. So if you have any questions now <laughs> or comments, I'm happy to entertain any question or try to answer any comment that you might have. And it would allow me to not have to talk anymore. Look so for right now, you want us to find a sculpture online that we are interested in to sculpt for ourselves? Yes, yes. Okay. 
It can be online. It can be any source material. I mean, I've got Vogue magazines here with art models. And sometimes I get ideas for, you know, these sculptures based on some of the crazy poses that the fashion models do. The fashion models do uh, crazy, insane poses to make the clothes look good and to make the designer look good. But there's nothing to say that I couldn't um, change that into, you know, a, uh, a nude because, of course, I do figure studies. So I'm always doing nudes. And uh, so sometimes I get inspiration even from fashion magazines. Um, Cameron, um, seem like you're not big on doing wizards. I knew I was going to get crossways with somebody who's into wizards and gaming of one kind or another. I'm not a gamer. I am so sorry. I don't do Dungeons and Dragons and I'm not a gamer, but if you are, I've had so many students do uh, characters from video games or characters from any place else, any other kind of um, fantasy-based gaming. So um, that is fair game. And if that's the kind of thing that really inspires you and you want to do that, I'm, I'm going to help you 100% to get that wizard sculpted this quarter or that troll or uh, orc or whatever it is you think you're gonna sculpt this quarter. So that would be fine too. And I hope I just made some people happy or smile or something. I don't, I can't tell. <laughs> Zoe, you're shaking your camera. <laughs> Are you gonna do an orc or a wizard or a, a games character? No, but that's only because I haven't done sculpting before. So I don't trust my skills in that, but yeah okay you can always there. blast one out like we do with the kitty and it only has to be this big and then it would be a you know game character piece that you could actually use in playing your game does I, that sound like fun yeah making a miniature of one of my characters would be fun okay think <laughs> but about i already it. have an idea of what i want to do and okay so yeah no sounds good well, um, we're coming up on an hour together, and I only want to lecture for an hour because nobody else wants to hear me uh, talk for more than an hour. So I have um, recorded this, and I'm going to post this as our second recording for our class. Art 244 just went live today in my Laker link in um, the e-learning thing. So I'm going to start building the shell in there and putting content in there. So um, I'll put our links to our two um uh, videos, uh, and then I'll, we'll continue to put video content in there. And that's where you will find the, um, the link to this class for Monday night. And hopefully we won't have to push out emails anymore. Um, the link uh, for the Zoom meeting will be in the main page on um, uh, e-learning for this class. And so that's where you can always go and open that up and then get right to this class on Monday and Wednesday nights. Uh, Paula, what's up? Will there be a discussion forum in our coursework and our little e-learning strip where we could talk or chat if we want to? Yeah. Or um, answer each other's questions. If we have a question real quick and maybe somebody remembers something we forgot um, about yeah, the I, process or things or whatever, or if, it, if somebody wants to troubleshoot something, if we had a discussion forum that might be helpful. Okay. Um, I will look. Uh, I can't remember if there's automatically a discussion forum that opens up in these things or not. I have not used the discussion forum in my classes so far, but I'm happy to enable one and you guys can go there if you want to. Um, you know, I can open up this class and after I do my dog and pony show for five minutes, you guys can use this as an open discussion forum and you guys can chitter chat back and forth. And if it gets too crazy, I might have to break you up into um, uh, separate chat rooms or discussion rooms, kind of like we do in the actual classroom where we put, you know, all the athletes together on one table and all of the, <laughs> all of the gamers together and the arts, artsy people on another table. And we can do that here too. So all the baseball players can sit around and talk about baseball and make fun of Hunter and Hunter. <laughs> well, all the other ones can sit around and talk about, you know, politics or gaming or whatever. Um, so one of the problems was that when we're, that we, this last term when we were doing that, is any time that there's a little noise and everybody has their mics on, it could be my dog scratching himself. 
and it kind of locks up the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Let's see. Hunter's on with his open mic. Did you have a question? No, I, I was just going to tell you that um, I'm a swimmer. Okay. I'm I don't swim mind team. swimmers. I have nothing against yeah. swimmers. I try to get the swimmers to actually hey, pose. Hunter. <laughs> I try to get the swimmers to pose for the um, art class's winter quarter, but I don't have a whole lot of luck with that. But anyway, I'm a big swimmer fit. I used to swim, you know, 40 years ago in another life, even this nasty body, you know, was in a swimming pool. Um, Kylie, did you have a question? When do we actually start like in class going to the classroom? Um, the deal that they made with me is that I have to teach this class online for five weeks and that possibly by the first or second week in February, um, if it looks like the pandemic is starting to subside and we have some safety that we might be able to start coming in during the bronze casting portion of the class. And definitely by the time we have to grind and polish on this stuff in the seventh week of the class, I'm gonna to have to break you guys up into groups of four and hopefully um, some of you are already in pods and stuff because you're on the same team and you can come in in groups of four to use the outdoor facilities. I have a fenced in area in the back where my air compressor and all of the compressed air grinders and electric grinders can be used at workstations. So we will get you in here, but it might be the sixth or seventh week of the quarter before that happens. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I had everything all set up for that since I came to this talk <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, and so once I get, once I finish putting together the ART 244 um, e-learning shell, um, the first day's class recording and this class recording and all the other ones will be there so that you can play some of the earlier classes and get caught up with stuff. But we're, we're pretty good here. Well, those were good questions. Um, and you know, for the good of the order, I do appreciate it. And I'm always interested in, in questions, but I think I should wrap it up. It's been an hour and you guys have been super patient. So when I get the kits, the tool kits all put together, I will ring the dinner bell and you can come over and pick them up. And it might be as early as Friday. So let's say good night for now. And if I email you guys and the kits are ready, you can come over on Friday. Otherwise, it's going to be at least Monday before the kits will be ready. And so look for my email either on Friday or Monday. And until next Monday at 6 o'clock, I want to thank you guys for coming. And have a good weekend, a good early weekend for me. Stay out of trouble. Don't do any insurrections at the nation's capital. And I'll see you again Monday night. Goodbye for now. Have a Bye. good one, friends. Yeah, yeah.